Hello, everyone. Hi, and thank you so much for joining us tonight with our live stream event, uh, Hard Surface Modeling, an evening with Jay Machado. Uh, my name is Josh Herman, and I am the Chief Creative Officer here at Noman School of Visual Effects, and it's a great honor they'll be introducing and hosting with uh, our guest. Uh, before I introduce Jay, I want to uh, thank Lenovo for sponsoring this event. Uh, Lenovo helps us continue to bring free educational events like this to you. Um, with that said, I'd like to introduce our guest, Jay Machado. Um, Jay and I actually attended Noman as students at the same time, so it's kind of cool that I'm going to be here with him uh, in an event now where we're both professionals with like almost a decade of experience each, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, Jay is a model supervisor at ILM, and uh, he specializes in hard surface modeling, texture painting, look development, and he's worked at ILM for about seven years and has nine years of experience as a digital artist. Uh, his credits include The Mandalorian, The Millennium Falcon, Smuggler's Run, Rogue One, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Transformers, Age of Extinction, and probably a bunch of other stuff that we don't have time to list. Uh, in addition, his work on feature films, uh, he's also worked on music videos, commercials, AAA games, and amusement park rides. Uh, so super happy to introduce Jay. Hi, Jay. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Josh. How are you doing? Good, man. Doing good. Hey, and while we're uh, doing our first digital event during all this stuff, uh, if you guys have issues with the sound or anything like that in the chat, please let us know if uh, me or Jay or anything is too loud. Uh, please give us a heads up and shout out at that. Thanks. Um, Jay, I heard that you won a VES award recently. Can I you, did. Can yes. you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, that was um, for the Razor Crest. Um, from the Mandalorian. Um, I would spent a lot of time working on that asset. Uh, the model was mostly done in art, but I did have to do some, you know, fixing and uh, some minor design work. Mostly it was texture work for me, mm -hmm. uh, but um, sort of the process of, of working through that and also being involved with the miniature shoot that mm -hmm. was going on as well, that, that, that was super fun that that's really i think what got us the award is that sort of double dipping with the the practical but um it was it was still very gratifying because the, gosh that that asset was like it just would not go away kept getting notes <laughs> um and you know I, i'm really proud of how it came out and you know with season two going on it's it's more notes and yeah it worked well, that's good though. That's exciting. Everybody loved the show, and we're all excited to see what you, uh, what you guys pull off this season for sure. I will be there on opening day. I guess it's called. I'll be there for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I will get out of your face, and I will let uh, Jake take over for the rest of the evening. Uh, all right, Jay. It's you. Oh man, <laughs> my heart is pounding. Um, so um, I don't have a solid presentation. This is more going to be like. A journey into my hard surface insanity. Um, it's uh, it's about how I'm, what kind of inspires me, what what how to find ref, how to start building things, um, how things fall together and start making sense. Um, but before I get into that, I do want to kind of talk a little bit about just hard surface modeling in general. Um, I guess I should start sharing my screen. Let me get that going. So can everybody see Maya? Oh, hold on. I have to actually hit share. Everybody see Maya in a bunch of weird shapes? OK, so this is kind of uh, you know just terminology type stuff about hard surface modeling. I think that, I thought this was interesting because um, I actually I teach a class. And I um, when I put the class together, I, I wanted to get this, this terminology down. And I learned that that these terms, um, which are common hard surface modeling terms, but I've I've heard you know people use radius and bevels and chamfers, and all these different terms. And I really wanted to to sort of look them up and define them. And they actually come from the woodworking world, and uh, these are kind of examples of each. So a bevel in like a woodworking term is just a forty five degree angle on a piece of wood, um, almost like you would join them together in a corner for a box. And that's what a bevel is. Um, chamfer is similar, but it's kind of just like a halfway thing. It's almost like just taking a 45 degree angle off the corner of something. And then uh, fillet is actually kind of the rounded edge, which is kind of one of the, the hard surface um, hallmarks. So you, you try to get that, that rounded edge. You can see that I have 
some of that going on here. Um, it's 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 a way to take off that that sort of CG curse uh, when you create a cube. Let me just move it over here. It's this sort of perfect geometrical thing that you can zoom into infinitely, and it will just always remain sharp. And that's kind of a dead giveaway that something is fake, is that sort of um, not catching light. Because if you look around you in the real world, everything sort of has that sort of rounded edge on it. Uh, my desk here, for example, has a bunch of different examples. Uh, keyboard, if you look at your keyboard, um, it's all the keys are, you know, they're machined, but they have that sort of roundness around the edge. So that's kind of the goal of, of hard surface modeling is, is sort of creating shapes and giving it that sort of, I guess, uh, realism. Uh, but these were the, the differences between the, the, the three terms. And um, I'm going to create another cube, actually, and bring it over here. Uh, shoot. Um, but what's interesting is when I want to do this kind of a thing here in Maya, um, I grab all these edges and I use the bevel tool. Now, it doesn't really make sense since that's what a bevel is, but there's settings on here that sort of that sort of make it make sense. If that that makes sense, it doesn't make sense. Um, so if I go to my bevel settings here, you see there's a chamfer option here, and I have it set to off because that's kind of what I typically do. Um, I have an offset that's sort of um, I like I don't like using offset as fraction. Uh, basically, if I did offset as fraction on, um, it would be, actually, it's exactly the same, which is kind of weird, but um, if I turn that off again and set this to like 0.1 and then turn this on, you can see that it sort of changes the way. A fractional bevel will sort of look at the overall shape and size the bevel that way. I like to be a little more precise and have a real world measurement, which is essentially one millimeter. This is a curve uh, to one millimeter. Um, so chamfer is off right now. If I turn chamfer on, and we get that chamfered edge like that. And as we add segments, now we start to get that fillet. So it's it's doesn't really matter. People are going to say it the way that they learned it or the way that they like it. Um, I just think it, I just thought it was interesting that those, those terms, you know, come from woodworking and it's not just like, you know, it, it's funny because everything in hard surface modeling or just even visual effects, it, it all has its origins from somewhere else because visual effects is relatively new medium still. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I'm interested in that sort of history stuff as you'll sort of see unfold in this, pseudo presentation. Um, but anyway, um, get rid of that cube. You see, I have a, another example here. Um, so the name of the game of hard surface modeling is just getting stuff to what we call uh, subdivide, right? And I, I know that, you know, probably a lot of Noman students are on here. This is more for people who, you know, are, are sort of just interested in this world and they, they don't know this stuff. But if I hit three, it sort of gives me a preview of that subdivision. We can still see there's kind of like faceted edges here. Um, it's it's um, it's just a computation of you know these two faces. What if we average these out? That's kind of what's happening. And for hard surface modeling, we add these extra edges. We call them supporting edges, or I call them supporting edges, and that sort of helps us to achieve that sort of fillet look. Now. Um, this is something that that my my own students often struggle with is um, adding support to both sides of this 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 curve. Um, I've seen you know sometimes this type of a thing, and that will give you sort of the filleted edge, but it also kind of gives you some unwanted curvature here. Uh, so that's something that I try to avoid. See how that got nice and straight when I did that. So that's that's something there. Um, there's also like different ways you can use the supporting edges. Uh, these two examples, like they look similar when you're just sort of looking at them. They're, they're essentially the same shape. But um, when we look at the, the way the edges are supporting shape, it looks very different. It's this one sort of is equal distant from the corner and this one sort of fans out. And you can see that that 
sort of affects the shape that's happening here. This one sort of flares, and this one is more of a consistent corner. So one of the other challenges of hard surface modeling is sort of getting more complicated uh, with shapes. But you can see that it's it's just following the same rules. Every time I have a, a essentially a plane change, which means like this plane does a 90 degree there, that goes there. Every time I have that, I have edges that support it. So that's that's kind of um, you know where where it is. I've got an edge on either side of the break, but then I've also got supporting edges on this side. And you see, this is kind of the tricky part: is how do you reroute those into doing uh, you know doing what you want, having control of the surface. Um, so as we move on, you know, more complicated shapes and how to achieve them. The important thing I find I find on shapes like this, where it's it's um, two pieces essentially intersecting is you want to control that curvature always. Um, so when you, you know, you, if you have a rounded shape and there's an edge over here, you might be tempted to sort of reroute that edge. That's going to change the curvature of the shape. So that's kind of something that I always look out for when I'm, when I'm doing this. And, um, you know, getting rid of pinching like areas like this is, is also another, uh, you know, challenge of, of this world, I guess. And then, to add, you know, more to that, there's oftentimes you have to cut panel lines and things and stuff like that. So, so stuff gets really complicated really fast, but it's all the same rules every time. It's it's supporting edges on either side of a plane change, which these ones are are kind of big, so it's it's kind of hard to to see them. But um, that's to control that curvature there. Um, for hard surface modeling, um, one of the things that that I, it took me a while to let go of is is stuff like triangles, um, and oftentimes uh, it's it's it a hard surface model doesn't have to deform like a character does, so you can kind of hide them here and there, and they don't they don't really give themselves away too much. You can see I got a little bit of pinching there, but that's that's fine. But anyway, that's that's kind of the real main rule of hard surface modeling is just having that. Um, having those supporting edges and and sort of how you control those. Um, so with the sort of fundamental stuff out of the way, I'm going to talk about this sort of journey that I've been on in, over the past uh, year. Um, if any of you are familiar with me already, um, I uh, worked on, or if you aren't familiar with me already, <laughs> I worked on episode seven and um, I was uh, essentially... I was the fourth artist to work on it, but I, I got to work on the Millennium Falcon asset. And while I was doing that, um, essentially this, the whole story is that Harrison Ford famously broke his leg on set and then production kind of slowed down. Um, some of the artists were sort of shuffled around to other shows, but I was relatively new to ILM at the time and I was sort of the cheapest guy in the room. So, um, they were like, you know what, we need to keep going on the Falcon, Jay, you start working on it. So, you know, I was obviously like, you know, practically pissing myself with with joy. It was it was an amazing opportunity. Um, but I sort of, you know, we, we we went, we got to go to the the archives and see the real miniature that that it was all based on. And there were a bunch of photos of it. There was uh, scans. Um, and if anyone has, has worked with scans, um, especially a few years ago, the, the, the fidelity on the scans isn't very good. So there was a lot of, of either guesswork or just kind of, uh, this kind of looks like a round shape. Let's kind of put a round greebly there and um, sort of fake it. But at a certain point, I found um, this community called the Replica Prop Forum. And this is uh, basically a forum of well, like it says, people who make replicas of movie props and stuff. And um, I have a, sort of an example here. Uh, this is uh, people who are involved in building their own scale model of the Millennium Falcon. And they have all these great photos that it's just like this community where all these like-minded people have just pooled all their reference together. And um, you know, figured out dimensions based on photos. And like, for me, it was like, I finally, like, I, I, it's like I'd found a giant and I could stand on this giant's shoulders to get, to get what I, the, the job done essentially. And um, I, it, it became almost like a quest to get things right 
for these people. I wanted to to really nail it in the movie so these people would would see what I've done and, and go, oh, you know what? He he really paid attention and 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 all that good stuff. I mean, but really, with with the film, there's there's constraints, there's budgets, there's timelines, deadlines, and stuff. So the the end the finished asset ended up being what it is and it's you know widely you know people like it i for me um it's imperfect if that makes sense because if i had more time i would have done it differently i would have um done more essentially um one of the one of the resources that i'd found um specifically on this uh replica prop forum is this uh this thread which is the Falcon's kit IDs. And um, if we go to this link, which I already have it open over here, I'll just pull it over. Um, it's, you know, a, a person who's basically compiled every scale model kit that the was used to build the Falcon. And so I saw this and, and thought, oh my God, this is a, an incredible resource. And in the same sort of thread as this, I found all these basically flatbed kit scans of these model kits. So if I go here to my source images, and you can see I just got just loaded with reference on this this ship. It became an obsession. But um, essentially, photos like this of model kit parts is what I was finding everywhere. And I was able to take these parts or these scans and use them to build all the parts of the ship. So I started a build of my own at home and that kind of became my big hard surface project at home for a very long time. It's still not done. Uh, this is my blog uh, sort of covering that. And it was also a chance to sort of illustrate some of these um, IDs for some of the kits, where they came from and that sort of thing. So this is, this became like a, a, a multifaceted project for me where I wanted to a build the ship that yeah, I've loved since I was a kid, but I also wanted to sort of give back to the community and sort of give them this map of, Hey, these are what all the parts are compiled into something that's, you know, a little more visual, a little more user-friendly and that sort of thing. And I also have, you know, th this project's unfortunately been, derailed my other projects, which so often happens to me, but I've made friends in this community and corrected some of this reference and found, you know, identified more parts that I hadn't had identified before. And so it's, it's snowballed into this, this massive project for me. And, and it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I also have enjoyed, uh, I don't know if there's any, see, here's some examples of, um, some of the model kit stuff. Um, it's it's cool too because you you find out as you study these these practical model builders that they've reused the same parts in certain other kits. This is from the Star Destroyer, and this is the medical frigate, and it's that same part right there. So discoveries like that really fascinate me and really get my mind going, and and like I want to just dive in and find that stuff out. Um, what was uh, this is one of my good friends, Lee. I'll give him a, a bit of a shout out. He's been a huge help on me. He's built his own five foot falcon and done his own research. And he's basically he's my 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 um, he he kind of is the gatekeeper for for my part maps. I send them all to him and I make sure that everything's right. And then uh, we sort of collaborate on that. Now, recently or as not really recently, probably a couple years ago. Um, he gave me more reference. And with that, I was like, oh man, I have, I have to do a bit of an overhaul on this. And it's hard when you have a finished model, like this was essentially, um, you know, I, this isn't a finished render of it. Let me see if I can find one. But um, essentially when you, when you have a model that's finished and then you find out something is wrong with it, or you did, you did so something you could have done better, then you kind of come back to it. It's hard to come back to it. So I had the Falcon to this point where I was basically ready to texture it. And I found out that a lot of these parts that I had weren't quite accurate. And at the time I didn't have good reference of the bottom. So I was kind of using the blueprints and 
then I found better reference to the bottom. This stuff like that happens to me all the time where, and then it's, it becomes a judgment call of, do I want to fix this or not? And the answer is usually yes, because I'm just an insane person and I want to, I want it to be right or I can't sleep at night, you know? So, um, I decided to revisit this project and very begrudgingly because, because it was so far along and that kind of led me to sort of look around at other things, other things I might be interested in modeling. And, um, you know, through these sort of communities, RPF and stuff, I, I was finding other stuff out too. I knew that, that, um, one of my favorite films is, uh, 1989 Batman and, huge film for my formative years. I think I was four years old when it came out and I had all the toys and, and all that good stuff. And on RPF one day, I found some, I found this photo. And this is, um, for anyone who's seen the movie, this is Batman's vault. This is where he keeps his suit. And this is the, this is the part where I get very tangential and, and crazy, but I'm also very into making things and costumes and, 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 cosplay stuff. And I, I had this idea of, you know, I, I pretty much every couple of years I make myself a new Batman costume. And I decided, you know what, this is going to be the 40th anniversary of 1989 or no 30th, excuse me, 30th anniversary of 1989 Batman. I want to do finally like a full awesome Batman armor build. And I think it would be cool if I had this vault as a model and I could do renders of it. And then, so I kind of got this idea over the weekend or, you know, one weekend and I thought, you know, this, this has to happen. It's, it's almost like inception for me. It's like, once I have that, that little itch, that idea of, of something, I have to, to build it. So let me just open this up real quick. So I built it. Um, now I found a bunch of, it, it, it's not just, you know, you find one photo and you build it. You have to go on a an insane deep dive. So that's essentially what I also did. I found all these pictures of it. I never knew that his tools were in the door, which is pretty cool, like all his grappling guns and batterings and stuff. I found someone who'd made a 3D print of one for their Hot Toys Batman. Um, I found some examples of, like, real safes and stuff and how they work how these gears work and you know people who had drawn up blueprints and that's what's what's great about like sort of um building stuff that that is like this that exists is there's fans out there who have figured stuff out like this and i like i hate to say it but you can stand on their shoulders and and sort of make some cool stuff um so this was a huge, huge reference for me. And um, obviously screen grabs of the movie, sort of what it what it looks like from, from various angles, close-ups of it, um, that sort of thing. You know, how how does learning how the how it functionally opens and stuff, that was kind of a huge deal for me too. Um, it, you know, and, and so it became this this passion thing. And all all in the name of making myself a costume and having a render with with the suit which incidentally i never did but what ended up happening is if i just sort of let the animation play here i ended up making something different so this is 1989 kenner batman and it actually came out in 1990 that's kind of a long story kenner lost the rights to toy biz for a couple years um, but this was my Batman toy when I was a kid. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I made this into a suit? And that's exactly what I did. So if I um, go over to my Instagram real quick, which my Instagram is kind of my haven for costumes. That's kind of where all the things that I like to make and, and sand and spray paint and all that stuff, all that, all that stuff is kind of, I put it on my Instagram. I don't know why I separate my social medias into diff, my different hobbies and stuff, but this is sort of the costume that I, that I had made. Oops, that's just pumpkins, but, oh, and that's the house. But um, I have this sort of build process of it. And I, I bought myself a big old 3D printer. It's right over there. It's uh, 
It's a Creality CR10 S5, uh, which can print 500 or 50 centimeters cubed, um, which was huge for making these big armor pieces, which you can see are quite large. I actually have the things over here. But um, yeah, this so this became a, a thing where I had my buddy do a scan of the, the figure, and then I took that into ZBrush and chopped it all up and reproportioned it to fit my body, which I also did a, a, a photogrammetry scan of, which I'll talk about photogrammetry in a little bit. But, um, you know, we even kept the little, the Kenner um, and the year, copyright year and stuff in the in the build. Um, and this sort of became my, my suit of armor that I wore instead of, you know, your traditional Michael Keaton rubber Batman armor, which I still want to do, and I still will do eventually. But um, this sort of became the cost. Here's a picture of the printer. You can see my Lego Falcon peeking in back there. Um, that thing, I... I had to I had to get it but it's like now what you know it's so big so anyway that's that's the least of my my falcon problems but here's the actual toy and here's the the pretty much the raw print of the um of the mask and then there's the there's how it sort of fits around me um so yeah that that was kind of you know and then went through all this process of painting it um well, here's all the pieces sort of <laughs> taking up. Th th this was back when my office was clean. My office, you can see behind me, is a, a huge mess. But uh, yeah, this was sort of the build process here. So when that was done, uh, that was, of course, for Halloween. And when that was done, I was like, that's cool. But something, you know, I, I couldn't just go back to the Falcon for some reason. I had to do more. And then I got this idea in my head, I got to do the car. Because I've loved that car since I was a little boy. I, I have to, you know, I, I've got Hot Wheels of it. I've got, you know, artwork of it and like, all kinds of stuff. So I, I decided that I wanted to start it. And for that, I knew I had to get, uh, um, you know, obviously research and stuff. Uh, I found this site called, uh, where is it? Oh, no, did I lose it? Oh, it's called Chicks Love the Car, and it's all about Batmobiles. And so they've got this huge, uh, if you go to Keaton Car here, they've got all these pictures of behind the scenes and close-ups. But what's different about this, uh, you know, as opposed to Star Wars, is Star Wars, the miniatures were there, they were on screen a lot. They They did this museum tour where, like, for example, this is these this is a photo set from one of those museum tours of someone got to get this close to this model and just photograph every inch of it. And with the Batmobile, the the trouble that I found is that there's a ton of people building them. So I had to dig through all this reference and sort of try to figure out, okay, is this a real Batmobile or is this a replica? Or, you know, what am I looking at here? And I found, you know, that this this site has it pretty well organized and at a certain point I actually got to go and visit it um it was at comic-con one year and I got to actually see it myself so I had a few photos of it as well um but you can see uh let me make these a little bigger I'll just make this whole thing a little bigger uh you can see that the the amount of reference you know measurements of, of the gauges and stuff um what you, you know all this stuff is out there people have just collected it and put it on the internet um to sort of you know with the hopes of i guess building their own car eventually you see this guy's got the you know the rope light and he's got the weird 66 batmobile steering wheel and stuff but it, and so that that's where it gets kind of tricky it's like well this obviously isn't the real one so you you kind of you kind of get an eye for it and um yeah but anyway um I knew that, you know, this, this, this reference is one thing, but building something in three dimensions is something else. And as luck would have it on the Mandalorian season one, which I was working on at the time, we were using a lot of photogrammetry and I was starting to get really into that. So let me open up one of my early Batmobile scenes. Let's go 89 bat scenes. And let's just open Batmobile one. 
and I'll sort of talk about my my process as this went, and we'll eventually switch to the the sort of finished model. Um, here's kind of an example of a of a scene that I'm working on. This is really a mess, but um, what I wanted to show is in where is it? Yeah, this group here. Let me just isolate this group. Actually, maybe I should um, do this in a different way. Let me. So essentially what I did is I have this model kit, which I built when I was younger. It's just the Batmobile. And I was like, I'm going to shoot this with photogrammetry. I'll spray it gray. So I knew that that would give me sort of the best results. Um, here's sort of uh, all the photos that I took. I just set it on a mat in my kitchen took a bunch of photos um, and photogrammetry. It's really about taking photos at different distances to create parallax. And it's about covering all the angles um, high and low and, and above and below and all that stuff. So I took all these photos of it and took it into a pro uh, program called reality capture, which is just the one we were using at work, but you can do Agisoft or there's, there's a few other um, programs as well, but you know, you get in close, you can get details, uh, you can feed all this information into it, and it'll essentially spit you out a three dimensional object. So if I unhide this one here, um, and let me make sure the textures are on. Yeah, so you can see what you get. Now, if I turn the textures off, this essentially looks like someone sculpted a Batmobile out of mashed potatoes from their memory. But um, when you turn the textures on, it's sort of, a you know, it's I, I kind of see this process as like the next generation of photo reference because realistically, if I were to build this, um, you know, say when I was a student, I'd have like a three quarter angle. I might even get as lucky, lucky enough to have somewhat of a side angle. Um, I'd have maybe a shot like this at the back, but more likely to be something like this. And um, having this in, in three dimensions, and even if it is just, it's just a model kit, I'm just using it for proportions. Um, this was a huge help in sort of informing uh, what my build needed to look like and where things needed to go. And the thing is, like, if you think about it, this is an artist's interpretation of the Batmobile, um, whoever sculpted this initial model kit, right? And there's things that are wrong with it. These vents across the back are not right. They actually should go straight across like that. Um, the, re the relationship between this back wing and this fender is a little wrong, but th there became a point where, where I knew that even if I matched this exactly, it would still be my artistic interpretation of, of the car. So I wasn't too married to this in terms of matching this. It was more for just, oh, this is what the shape looks like in three dimensions. Uh, this is sort of where I need to go. You can see this, this awful hole in the hood. And that's actually, um, that's the specular highlight messing with the photogrammetry software. So you want stuff to be really nice and matte. What was cool though, is I also um, was able to sort of scan the bottom. Oops. So this is the, essentially like I flipped the car over and shot a bunch of photos of the bottom of it. So, you know, I didn't end up following this too closely because I mean, it's it's made up also. Uh, the real chassis of it, I knew, was uh, uh, from a Chevy Caprice and um, doesn't look like this on the bottom. But um, yeah, the, the, the other thing is like I took the canopy off and did a quick shot of the interior, which, you know, it's it's probably not to scale or, or correct, but it, it was something to start with, which was really cool. Uh, now, if I turn this off and go back to my build, uh, you can see a couple things here. Um, at first, I started with something a little lower res. Uh, this is kind of the resolution that I started with. And really for this shape, I just sort of traced this line. And that was sort of the beginning of what it was. And then, you know, once I traced that line, I could sort of move points around so it sort of matched that line of the top. And that's sort of where I started this build. And then, you know, make some extrusions to pull out the fenders and stuff. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually um, 
my technique for uh, where I need to make cuts in the geometry. So, you know, if I unhide that first kit, you'll see that a lot of these, um, a lot of these lines sort of align with it, you know, having this little doors here. And these are just kind of like placeholder geometry. I don't use these for Booleans or anything. I'm really just taking it and then I'll start tracing the shape um, on here. You can see I've started to do that here. But what ended up happening with this was when I got to an area like this, if I isolate this guy um, and I try to smooth it, having getting this detail on here to work properly, it's a little, let me see if I can mess with the eccentricity here. Uh, let's pull that down. So pulling the eccentricity down will make it nice and like um, the, the spec highlight nice and sharp. You see how lumpy that's getting? And that's because of all of this extra geometry that I need to support these shapes. So what I ended up doing was deciding that I, I need to go higher res on this. Um, so what I do for that, which uh, let me just sort of show a quick example. Um, if I have a shape like this and um, let's, let's make this really obvious by bringing this down to like 12 sided cylinder. Um, I'm going to add some subdivisions to the height, maybe just one for now. And then let's just make some extrusions in. Oops, that's not what I want. Turn, where is it? Uh, keep faces together is off. So let's turn that on. And I don't know why I would ever have that option off, but this is 2020, so I haven't used it a whole lot yet. Yeah, why is it? You know what? Let's go back. Let's go to Edit Mesh Extrude, and let's take that off. Is it not even in here? Oh, this is going to be annoying. I think it's in preferences, actually. What? OK, well, for the time being, I'll just deal with it. Uh, let's see, keep faces together on. So I've got this shape. If I smooth this out, it's going to lose its, its shape. Um, and what I kind of like about um, kind of one of the practices I like to, to keep or kind of what am I trying to say? So one of the habits I like to keep is keeping my um, shapes well defined. You can see I've got a bold line on here. That's basically an edge crease. And so that's one of the ways that I can add um, subdivisions without destroying um, what I've got here. So I like the profile here of these corners. This is exactly the shape I want, but I just don't have enough resolution around the side of it. What I can do is open up the crease set editor. She'll pop up over here. Um, and let's just, I'm going to just double click. So I grab all the edges and why not? Let's just go to edge loop and create a new crease set. Now I'm going to set this to three. Um, actually, let's leave it to, let's leave it at two. So, um, when you hit smooth now, it maintains that shape, but it looks kind of crappy. Um, the reason for that is these edge creases, they work on a principle of, um, basically you need a certain amount of smooths to sort of round this shape out. Now, if I go over to display here and hit optimal, you see that now it starts to look like a sort of your hard surface. It's got the fillet right um, on it. So that is actually three subdivision levels. If I increase this number to three, you see it, it goes back to that crappy look again. I have to go back to optimal. And then these creases get tighter. So this is, this is a, a technique that's used a lot in games. Um, a lot of times where you just need, you, you know, you don't need subdivision topology. You just need something that sort of deforms nicely that you can bake normals from or something. You could use this technique. But what I like to use it for is just adding that, that extra um, level of uh, resolution. So I'll leave this at three. I'm just going to hit smooth. And you see, I still got my tight corners, but now I've got basically twice as many, um, 
twice as much geo around there. Now I, I, I have to clean this up a little bit. Um, I don't have to, but you know, of course, that's part of my craziness. Um, where I'm just, you know, grabbing faces, merging them to center. And now I've got basically that cylinder shape back. And I could go here, sort of delete all these extra edges that were created. Delete that one too. And I'm basically back to the same shape I started with, but now I've just got more resolution. Now, it looks kind of, you know, bad because the, the normals are smooth. But um, if I go to uh, soften hardened edges, it will usually take care of that. And it's, it's just uh, softening by the angle and the 90 degree angles sort of kick it off. Um, now it's typically when I will just delete that crease set to get my shape back. And then when I want to sort of add my hard surface bevels, which remember I'm doing by um, their actual size in the scene, when I hit bevel, it's going to default to that 0.25. Where is the little magic window that's supposed to pop up? Is that not? I guess that's not working. Uh, but I can come to this uh, the channel box here and sort of adjust that. Maybe 0.25 is a little too tight. Maybe I want it to be half a centimeter. And then when I um, smooth this guy, now I've got my sort of nice subdivision mesh. So this Batmobile here is sort of, oops, this is before I've added the, the sort of billet, chamfer, bevel, whatever you want to call them, edges into it, because I'm still sort of cutting these shapes into the, into the surface. I just sort of decided that, you know what, I need to go higher. So I did, and that's how I got there. Now you see, I had to, I, I, I made some mistakes where I'm starting to lose my, Stuff that all had to be fixed later, but uh, yeah, basically that. Uh, one of the other things that I want to sort of talk about um, in terms of my workflow is you'll see a folder in all my files called work in progress. And um, I keep these around. If I sort of unparent this, this was my initial shape, and this is before I smoothed it. So I keep all this stuff around. Um, while I'm while I'm have a working scene and just in case I need to go back to it. So usually when I hit a milestone, I'll do a couple things. I'll put I'll put the shape that I'm about to do more work on into this work in progress folder and I'll save my scene. And that's sort of that. Let me go now to the sort of finished model. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go to this guy. And let's not save that. No, save it. Uh, by the way, Josh, if there's any interesting uh, questions that you're coming across on in the chat or anything uh, regarding anything I'm doing, just let me know. Um, sure. Uh, one question that's come up, and as you were showing some modeling stuff, was uh, kind of a, a question about ingons and triangles. Okay. Um, I guess how do you feel about them? Um, triangles I'm cool with. Ingons I I don't I don't like. Um, I'll usually at the very least triangulate. Let me turn on my, um, I'm just going to set this to one subdivision level. Um, so you see here, I've got my, um, I've got my, my ed, my normals are essentially softened, but I still have that sharp corner here. And that's something that I, I, I try to maintain. Um, in terms of, uh, back to this sort of Engon's question, um, there's lots of areas here where I'm sort of hiding triangles and, um, just as a necessity to sort of to support all this topology. But you see that that every every corner has a, that supporting edge. Um, I'm going to be really embarrassed if I find any engons in here right now. But it, it could be possible. Um, if you want to find engons, this is kind of a cool trick. You go to face mode, which is F11. Grab everything, which might have been a mistake because there's a bunch of faces in here. I'll turn on the um, poly count so you guys can see if I could remember where it is. Yeah, so yeah, not, not too bad. Um, no in five. Um, so if you go to select now, uh, use constraints, this little window will pop up. 
you go to all the next and hit incited. Uh oh. There's definitely some. Let's see where these guys are. Man, I've, I've, I've really failed, you guys. <laughs> okay, so some parts from the interior. So what do we got here? Let's find these end gons. Oh, yeah. That's an embarrassing one. Good thing is you can always just go in and edit these whenever you want. Nothing has to be perfect on your first go, right? A few on there. Okay, some. Oh, I see. See, I've got those edges coming around the back like that. And then they just meet that face there. I'm not going to go through and clean all these up. I'll just bore you guys. But um, yeah, this is actually the, the brake pedal. And what's interesting about that is something that I had to uh, find another site, which let me pull it up. Uh, this site, which is moviescreencaps.com. Huge, huge um, resource. It's got, basically, they just take a screen grab every few frames. Um, I don't remember where this would be, maybe around 50. Oh, I went a little too far. Let's do 48. So here's the scene where he's coming, they're driving to the Batcave. And, oh, no, I went, it's the page before this. Let's see here. But this, this, I have, you know, every time I'm working on something, I end up rating this site, but here's the pedal. And so shots like this, I, I mean, I, you would, it'd be very rare to actually get a decent view of this pedal. But also, it's it's kind of like the type of thing where you're never going to really see that in the model. But it's it's just something that I kind of know is there, if that makes sense. Um, this actually, for some reason, should be softened. Yeah, so I like to just, uh, when, I, when I build a model to subdivide, I always like to hit that sort of um, soften all the edges on, on it because from a distance, it's kind of like, hey, you don't really need to subdivide it. It's kind of got that look already. Um, so that's kind of a, another habit that I'm into. It's it's frustrating to me that I'm finding all these mistakes in this model today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you can see that, you know, like I, I, I sort of tried to recreate what that thing is doing. Um, a big part of it, um, if, if I go into, where's my folder of car parts? Um, no, no, it's in the screen caps one. Um, a big part of of uh, figuring this one out in particular was sort of being able to go through and seeing how it moves. So having those three frames was uh, super helpful. So um, yeah, you know, uh, I didn't go crazy on this. There's a lot of this sort of weird mechanical stuff that I didn't build, but for you know the purposes of of you know, what I'm doing, that's kind of good enough. Like if you, if I wanted to render like a, a 360 degree image where you're sitting in the Batmobile, um, you know, that's kind of what all you would really see anyway, which I've thought about and I will do. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, a, a, oh, by the way, this tool, um, while I still have this open, if I try to work on something like say i want to move this notice how no faces are being selected here that's because this is still live even if i close this it's still live so when you do use that um, tool go back to it use constraints you want to close and reset every time and now i can go back and grab faces as i want um so yes um but yeah and guns i don't like <laughs> so Best believe that after I'm done with this stream, I'm going right in there and fixing them all. Uh, but yeah, so you can see what I did with the bottom. There's some of the stuff I, I copied, but some stuff I, I sort of used other reference. Um, and I got some just random greebly parts 
in there as well. And tires. Um, I had a lot of fun actually texturing this guy. This was my first time using a substance painter. Let me see if I can get this to render somewhat nicely. Actually, I'll just delete this plane. Um, this is my first week using V-Ray. Um, V-Ray was something that got real popular when I was at Nomen, so I'm a little late to the party. Uh, but um, I've been digging it so far. Um, it's it's a little... Uh, the materials are a little easier for me to understand than um, Arnold sometimes, um, and you don't have as much salt and pepper um, noise as Arnold. I mean, there's still noise in any render unless you're you're willing to wait. And this might take a minute because there's a lot of textures, but I think um, I don't remember how many udims of texture this is. I think it's about 25, um, which isn't isn't crazy, but um, it's certainly something to consider when you are uh, rendering stuff. So this is just a simple V-Ray dome light with an HDR mapped into it. It's like a studio environment. But, um, and, and you know, this car is just, it's, it's shiny black paint. There's some dark metals and stuff. But I had a lot of fun in like the, the details uh, here. This was a lot of uh, fun. I'll just sit and let this render for a minute. But lots of material variation and, and wear and rust and good stuff in this area that I had a lot of fun painting. I also uncovered uh, a, a little bit of research um, what some of these parts are from. And, and this is all from that uh, Chicks Love the Car site. But this is, this is actually a badge that's on there. It's, a, it's called a Teddington Actuator. And uh, if I go back to my reference and go to car parts. Um, there's, yeah, there's examples of that in here. So obviously reference is a huge thing, um, but it's also kind of, you know, using your intuition. It's finding out what things are called um, and sort of being able to, to search for them. For example, I, I knew that this was built on a Chevy Caprice. Um, so I figured it was probably a late seventies model. Um, so I looked for, you know, appropriate brake pads and stuff, and that's sort of what my brake pads look like, except there's a little bat on them. Um, so stuff like that, you know, I, I, I learned that the, the, the big petrol caps on the top are from a London city bus. So, you know, it's just stuff that, that I've amassed while watching special features and just generally being obsessed with this movie and this car, um, the, the type of headlights that were used. Uh, these are examples of those, uh, these actually rings that are on this area here, which you can see that I've uh, I've modeled out. Uh, where's where's one? Right here. So this is just sort of my interpretation of that uh, part. And you see, right now everything is is unsmoothed, uh, meaning it's not subdividing; it's very faceted. But you know, from a certain distance, that kind of fades away, and it just sort of looks like it's supposed to. Another thing I, I got in the weeds on researching was the machine guns, which um, bring me to another sort of uh, resource is uh, cab models. So a lot of times, um, a, a lot of real world stuff like this, especially military stuff, exists on the internet out there. And I mean, you might find one on TurboSquid that, that's available for purchase, but um, one of the sites that I really like to to sort of frequent is um, let's see, is it called Sketchfab or GrabCAD or something? Um, it's it's one of the two. Uh, no, I think it's I think it's actually GrabCAD. Sorry. But what's cool about this uh, this community is a lot of these models are 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 just free, and you can kind of uh, look for it like. Um, these machine guns are called 1919 machine guns. And you can see them right there, Browning 1919. And then this is like one piece from it, but <laughs> there's a, let me see if I can find a better example. Browning. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's show all matching cat models. And what's cool is, um, that's weird. Is there only three? It's weird because I know I got this model from this site, but anyway. Um, 
the, there's a bunch of stuff on here. It's worth having a look. Um, it's a lot easier to understand what's going on in 3D if you actually have a 3D model because all the other stuff that's available for these uh, guns, let me exit this, uh, da, 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 is like stuff like this where it's, it's just either old photos of it or um, technical drawings, that sort of thing. Um, so what I did was I, I really, um, I, I got a nice CAD model and um, actually, let's hide this guy. See that there's uh there's, oh this is this is part of the the door this is just a little mesh grill that um let me stop you right for a second give my computer some time to breathe so yeah this this is just the machine gun i ended up uh, building it's nothing like too spectacular why isn't it letting me see it Maybe it wasn't selected or something. Oh, it's zoomed way out. That's weird. Some funky stuff going on. So, you know, it's just it's just kind of your simple um, gun with bullets hanging out the side. I made this sort of ammo chain. There was some nice reference of that, um, that sort of thing. I don't know if I'll ever do anything where the, these doors pop off and the guns come out, but they're there if I need them. I'm a bit. Uh, so yeah, GrabCAD's a, a huge one. Obviously, you know, stuff like Turbo Squid. And if you if you sort of if you're just using it as reference, I, I think it's all fair game um, in terms of modeling it. I would never use a model straight from there, but Hey Jay, we're getting a lot of questions about your reference actually. Okay. How much time do you think you spend re researching things like on all the projects you've been showing from the Falcon to the Batman stuff? You must be spending like it feels like hundreds of hours on research. Um, it, it's not all at once, so it doesn't feel like it's um, it doesn't feel like a lot. Um, usually, I find um, like for example, this this area was probably like you know, and obviously I'm not working eight hours a day on this. I'm I'm just doing a couple hours here and there throughout the week, but this was probably like a a week, a week and a half of of time modeling. And probably the first couple of days of that were just gathering images from that. But the thing is with that, if you find the right site, which that um, that website that I was using, I'm sorry, this, uh, this one has a bunch of photos of it. And it, it, if you go, um, let's see, da, da, da. see there, there's like categories and stuff. Uh, let's see, I don't know where this would be. Prints, maybe gadgets. But you can see that that they've they've got it all organized, so it's not really like oh I got to search for more, and you know a good Google image search will lead you to a site like this, like if I um search for uh, 1989 Batmobile side mech, I obviously get Lego sets and and all that kind of stuff, but um, eventually. Oh man, maybe <laughs> watch this be fruitless. Uh, let me see. If maybe neck is not the right word. Uh, that will be all. I view. So uh, that's. Is that CG? That's interesting. So, it, it, you know. A lot of it starts with just a Google search. Um, you know, then you find something like this and it's like, well, where is this from? And sometimes you um, go to, well, this is just a GIF of somebody's figuring out there. But, you know, sometimes a related image will stand out. Sometimes a, a kind of a blueprint will stand out and it will lead you to these sort of sites. Um, a lot of times... Another resource, and I'll give a shout out to my uh, uh, another friend of my another friend of mine is is this guy uh, James, and it's funny because he's a friend now because I reached out to him, and he runs this eighty uh, nine Batman Let me actually bring in this other tab of it, but he uh, 
he runs this this uh, site, and it's just dedicated. Oh God, it's just dedicated to all this stuff. And, and if you go, he's got this all sort of figured out. Uh, video press kit stuff. Um, you know, these are all interesting to watch. Uh, Eighty nine press kit. There's there's all kinds of stuff you can uncover, like discovering sites like this. And nine times out of ten, I'm discovering sites like this when I'm looking for something obscure on here and I find it. Um, so like, let's say I really want to see like the afterburner or something. Um, and I find a site like this and then I go and now I'm at this 89 Batmobile car and now I've got links and look, chicks love the car, Batmobile, you know, there's, all these sites are sort of interconnected and, and you, you'll make your way around the internet finding this stuff. Um, but yeah, where was I going with this though? <laughs> oh, the, the other thing that I, I had fun with, um, was the tires. So let me actually uh, subdivide this so we could, uh, let me grab the whole wheel and subdivide the whole wheel. Uh, no, 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 I don't want to, um, uh, I don't want to subdivide the actual treads. The treads ended up being very heavy, so I just kind of leave them um, as they are. But what's cool about this is I actually made my own um, sidewalls for the tires. And now I've done this before. I've done a few cars in my day um, in terms of... Um, and usually what you do is you go tire sidewall texture i'm sure we've all used this same one um which one is it was the one that i got before it was like an eagle one yeah this one so i've used this one before but i decided you know what i want to do my own spin on it and i had this idea of um uving it in a way that made this easier so what i ended up doing Gosh, is this, if this loads, but what I ended up doing is UVing the, 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 basically the cylinder straight. So I laid it out, I cut it. Like, I think there's a seam here or, or somewhere. I mean, this, this will show up in a minute, but it's actually got my last name on the tire, which is kind of cool. And I love putting Easter eggs like that in, in, into stuff. Um, if I go now over to. I'll just go to my actual um, image um, and you can see where the uh, here's that that Eddington actuator. Somebody made this file of this um, what this plate looks like. This is the this is basically for if you wanted to make a sticker and put it on your Batmobile that you're building. And I just, you know, took it as a substance and used it as a texture, which was, you know, why not? The other thing I love about doing cars too is the photos on automotive sites where you buy stuff. Like if I just search for gauges, um, like I, I like this auto meter brand, um, you know, going, this is all stuff directly from like a site where you would go to buy this stuff. And it's like perfect for like, oh, I want, I want to make a texture that looks like this. And so what I end up doing is, um, is having, you know, bringing those into Photoshop and making a, essentially a, a texture. So this is my texture. This is all my recreated text from all those emblems. Um, I got like a little screen on the inside and I'll, I'll, I'll show the interior in a moment, but um, here's sort of that, that Goodyear Eagle texture. There it is. Oh man, I didn't think it would take this long to open. Oh, let's see this. So yeah, see my, my last name there, Machado. Um, let me turn this back off. And I'm going to actually, while we're sort of talking about this, I'm going to open up the canopy, which I made a special set-driven key for. Look at that. I love setting up stuff like that. Um, let me just kick off a quick render of the interior. And we can go back to this. So uh, where is that tire, though? I also made, um, I've made headlight bump maps with my name initials in there backwards so you could see them the right way. Um, and how I make this stuff is is actually, it's kind of fun. Oh, but here's my, um, 
Here's my tire sidewalls. So essentially, the tire UVs are here along the bottom. And I think I might even have an example of the UVs in here somewhere. And might be buried. And you see my source images gets really messy. But um, essentially, I was able to just make all this stuff straight. And a lot of these numbers and, 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 and that sort of thing are Easter eggs as well. If I go down to the bottom here. Oh, that's a little close. But 731, that's my date of birth. Um, BMB 1989, obviously Batmobile. Uh, these are these are actually like variations of me and my brother's birthdays. I, I love putting stuff like this into there that you know no one will ever see, but I, it's kind of like just cool that it's there. Um, you're frowned upon doing that at work, incidentally. Uh, but <laughs> you know, if no one finds it, then. But I'm not going to encourage that. Um, but anyway, how I how I make this stuff is essentially I I just model this stuff out, and then just uh, bake it as a height map onto a plane, and then I've got this this pattern. Um, I can actually show an example. But here's here's like the finished uh, interior, and what was cool is is this uh, for this tune render actually took my model into Keyshot, rendered it with a tune render, and then just sort of put it together in Photoshop and then you know I've got that I've got um it's gonna it's gonna you know mess it up but I've got this little Batman keychain I saw somebody's uh photo of their car and they had this exact keychain and I thought it was just too funny to like include that in there like Batman's got his own keychain but um yeah stuff like that I, I love I love hiding that stuff so eventually I finished the car and I was like, you know what? That's great. I, I really want to do something with it because, you know, you can do turntable renders. I, I, I have, um, I have turntable renders of this thing. If I go to key shot, I, I did one. Um, uh, it's this guy here. Let's just open it with that. Why not? Of course it's on my other screen. Let me stop it and actually get it. Come on, you stupid thing. Oh man, that was like not the right choice of app to use for that, I guess. Let's go open with, da, 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 da. just use photos. So this is just a, a simple key shot render, got a basic, um, and you know, plugging all my substance painter maps into key shot, which was, uh, you know, had to do a bit of research on that. You see my Machado wheels and 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 all that good stuff. I, but you know, it it doesn't really like a, a turntable is is you know obviously a hallmark of of showing off your model. You got to do turntables. But like I really wanted to showcase more of the car, and I had this idea of using the music from that scene um, where they're going in the in the Batmobile. And I don't know if you guys will get in trouble for music. I won't play it. But um, it's basically you know that whole scene where they're driving through the forest. And that is, uh, you, you know, the, the theme thing. And I thought that theme song is a minute and a half long. Maybe I could do some kind of cool camera moves or something and showcase like, oh, maybe I can showcase the guns popping up or maybe these doors opening. I actually um, have as well. It's, I don't I don't have it set up with this fancy set driven key, but I've got actual grappling hooks in here. I'm hearing noises. Are you guys hearing that too, or is it just? Yeah, so these grappling hooks actually pop out and they can open up too. Um, I just need to set that up. But I wanted to showcase like all these features of the car. Um, I thought about having like this raking camera move along the bottom so you could sort of see the bottom of it a little bit. Um, even though it's nothing special, it's just, you know, it's just basically flat panels and, and greeblies and bolts and here, stuff like that here and there. Uh, but, you know, I, I thought, yeah, it'd be really cool to to showcase that. And then I was like, you know, it'd be kind of cool is if I sort of recreated a bit of the cave. And I was like, that's probably not that difficult. You know, it's most of it fades into darkness. Um, so, you know, I'll just sort of, um, I was thinking actually of this. Um, there's a map painting that was done of the cave. 
And this is, you know, they've arrived at the cave. He comes, he turns the lights on. Uh, that's It's all in that scene. But I was like, you know what? This doesn't look too complicated. I could throw some stuff together for this. Um, so I started sort of blocking it out around the car. I mean, this basically the car is at the origin. I start building these these big shapes around it, figuring out the camera angles and stuff. And of course, that became a rabbit hole that I started going down as well. Now, one of the cool things is um, I saw this this texture on the wall, and I knew immediately that it was kind of this bunker texture that I'd seen before. And if I go to textures.com, which is actually a huge resource that I love to use, I, I pay for like a premium account on this. You can see I've been using my credits. But they actually have 3D scan materials. And if I go to concrete, they have like that bunker material. And I saw this and I was like, oh, I could use that. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's great. It holds up. It's two meters. I can tile it. Um, it's got all the maps I need to just plug into whatever I'm doing. And so I, I got a few of those textures on here. Um, and let me open this. Uh, is this the one I want? Yeah. So basically what I did is I got these, um, I got these maps and I, I just grabbed a few of them that I liked, um, that I thought I could use for this, this cave. Well, what did I do? Something weird happening. I need to exit some of these photos I'm not talking about anymore. Oh yeah. This was a, this was another, uh, scene that I sort of was working on but basically um and and this actually is a great example of sort of what i was talking about in terms of baking so i needed this diamond plate for um for the basically the turntable that it arrives on um at some point so i'll just i'll just talk about this for a second see I, this is where i'm this is where i was like oh yeah i'm gonna be all over the place tonight uh basically this shot here you see there's this diamond plate on this turntable so I was like, I can make that. Um, I modeled this this quick piece um, and just sort of smoothed the hell out of it. And actually, my trick for for doing this bake is I do a side view of it. And um, if I go to a planar mapping, I turn this image uh, height width off. And when I hit apply or project, why isn't it working? And this is acting weird on me. Turn to polygons. This is polygons. That's very weird. Anyway, what this does, though, it, it's already got UVs, so I don't really need to do this. It essentially builds these. Um, it, it builds these UVs from zero to one, and what you can do then is assign a ramp to it. So if I go in the material, it's just a simple. Lambert material, but I basically got a ramp from sort of mid height to one. And you can see that reflected on here. Um, the high points become white. And then what I do is I basically have a, a, a like a duplicate of this plane, which right here, that's UVs are also just zero to one. And then I use, uh, if I go to, uh, you got to go to rendering mode. This is an old school thing. You could do this kind of thing everywhere, but basically transfer maps. But what's cool about using this method with the ramp is I'm just baking diffuse color. I'm not worrying about calculating normals or displacement. So basically having that ramp from gray to white um, and then baking it out as diffuse map. And uh, by the way, um, if you need to know the distance here, you just go to both and then you can see the I need to actually, where's the envelope? I can't see it. Man, this is really weird. Getting some weirdness. So let's set this to both. Oh, it's really not showing it. It's probably like a V-Ray thing. I've noticed a lot of stuff is breaking with V-Ray. Maybe we switch to, we switch to, oh, it's already on Arnold. This weird stuff, but basically, 
that should show you kind of the distance. It's basically a representation of the geo that looks inflated out. And you just make sure that this, this other geo that you're banking from is encapsulated in that. Um, so anyway, apart from that, let's go to uh, the, 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 switch this to Arnold. Um, and if I turn this on, basically what I did here is these um, materials came with height maps. And if I go here, I basically applied these height maps to planes. I, um, if you go into Arnold, you can go to utilities and bake selected geometry. So I basically applied the displacement um, map to these planes. And then I baked out, um, you know, obviously the geometry took it into ZBrush and down resed it. So I had something that wasn't billions of polys. And then I was able to, um, basically, where is this? I'll just hide this cave kit. Um, I was basically able to, where's my render view? Let's go viewport two and then back to Arnold. Um, I bet V-Ray is breaking this too. So Arnold, like I, I, I've just grown tired of Arnold. Um, there's there's things about it that that I like. I like how it you can do this IPR in the viewport. V-Ray, you can do it as well, but I'm still kind of figuring it out. But I, you know, you can see that I've got that bunker material there. I didn't end up using the actual displaced geometry for the bunker material, but like these pebbles and rocks and and um, and the, the cliff walls are all from uh, this um, 3D scan section of, uh, like, if I go to rocks and stuff. So here's the, um, one of them is here. But basically, this is the type of stuff that I that I downloaded to, to basically create, um, you know, building blocks for this, this environment. And this is just, you know, will test of, of that. And I ended up actually building, um, this is getting a little ahead of myself, but I'll show you while I'm here. I ended up building a, a shape for this, um, this very specific staircase in the cave. that looks kind of like this. And I ended up um, baking displacement into it and doing a little bit of sculpting in ZBrush to, to make it a little nicer. But the rest of the stuff you'll see is um, basically just taking these planes and sort of sculpting them in, into place like this. So let me open the cave scene. But what was interesting is that led me to um, my friend James's site because, uh, where is it? Uh, where, I think he's over here. This one, he has all these, all these behind the scenes photos that I'd never seen before. And the one that was really inspiring to me, um, obviously these are, these are two of them that were really inspiring is, is this is an actual maquette of the, the layout of the cave. So I saw this and I was like, oh, I can totally figure this out based on this, these two images, you can kind of see where stuff is, but the real, um, the real kicker for that was actually in here. There's this shot, which I saw on a trading card of this reverse angle of the cave. And I, I looked at this and I was like, oh, I can see everything of, you know, this is where the computer is over here. You can see his chair. You can see this other station here is actually where Alfred serves him some tea at some point. And then what's even cooler is I found this and this is you know just geeky tim burton i think it's like second or third movie um just on the set and what's cool about this is uh you know you you get an idea of what the lighting is doing um you know maybe a little bit better um reference of what the rock looks like uh, sculpturally and stuff like that um, but this is just kind of showing uh, some other things too one of the things that, that kind of still baffles me is if you look at this turntable here, it actually is much smaller than the car. So that kind of led me to think like, well, what's going on here is the, you know, 
is the matte painting just sort of fixing that or it's just really weird. Um, but, but one of the most interesting things about seeing this reverse angle of the cave is if I let the scene play, which let me just grab it real quick, come back to that moment. But here's that matte painting. They exit through this doorway here. And then here's that chair. And then here's that other doorway. So it's actually like a moment of movie magic where they go through here and then portal through here. So I was like, I was like, that's so cool. So I wanted to, I wanted to capture that in, in my uh, cave scene as well. So first thing I did uh, was, you know, sort of block in some of the shapes. Um, I brought in all kinds of the map, the map paintings and stuff. You can see I've got uh, sort of, um, I use the 2D pen and zoom tool to build stuff. Um, but if I show the image plane, you can see, you can see how stuff is lining up. Um, I brought my Batman figure scan into here as the scale man. Um, and you can see some of the pipes don't quite line up. Um, I, I'm sort of making some stuff up in the background here where there's some forced perspective and stuff like that. If I go to my cams, let me just adjust this image plane so we can see it a little better. Turn the alpha gain up a little bit. But you can see that there's there's stuff back here that's just painted. It's just forced perspective stuff. Um, so I just kind of threw in some geo that kind of worked there. But um, once I started blocking it, like I think this is the first view that I tackled. I lined up the car and then I started blocking in these shapes. And then I started bringing in other matte paintings. And then this is the, this is the second one. Um, if I bring the alpha gain down on this guy, you can see, oh, what's funny about this one is it's actually inside of a, a wall. So I have this special... Oh, is it? Do I not have it here? Anyway, I can just grab this geo and hide it. And then there's my lineup. But you can see now I, I have sort of an idea of where this, this rocks are going and where the staircase is. It doesn't line up perfectly and the pipes certainly don't line up perfectly. But, um, you know, it, it's it's cl it's close. It, and and I, I had to make some concessions for sure to get everything to work together. Um, and that's just, you know, the nature of of not really knowing what the what the um, camera what was used and, and that sort of thing. If I bring the alpha gain up, you kind of see. I also refused to put this little cage in there. I thought that was kind of silly. Um, so it doesn't have it. it. You know, it's my artistic license. Uh, one of the things that also inspired me before I get too far into this was I saw this diorama on Facebook of a guy who had made like just it's just like a little Hot Wheel. And by the way, don't think I haven't thought about building this guy next. But, you know, this is just like a little diorama that this guy made. And I thought it was I thought it was cool. And I was like, oh, that, you know, kind of kind of energized me into into doing this project. So if I just sort of cycle through these various screen screen caps and sort of um, like screen cap one, you know, you can see that, you know, these different areas coming together. Um, and this, these are all just screen grabs, screen grabs from that screencaps.com site. Uh, if I go to panels perspective, let's go to the second one. So that's just a, another view of that angle. You can see the pipes line up actually pretty well in this one. So it's kind of like I, I definitely favored uh, certain images over others. So you can see that the chair lines up a lot better in this one for whatever reason. Um, let's go through some of the others. Let's, let's pick like random. So this is the, the sort of back computer area, um, which I've also, um, I haven't really gone over there, but I've modeled all that out as well. And you can see that you, you see this machine in the foreground. This is actually the, this is the worst piece of reference. I basically have this to go off of. And then one other view, which I think is screen grab four. This is the only reference I have of this, this machine here, um, is this, this sort of sequence of shots. It's got this big bank of fog over it. It was like just a nightmare. So I, I definitely uh, saved it for last. Um, oops. If I go back to my sort of normal camera. Um, and basically all I did was sort of kit bash from stuff that I built from other areas and just made it up. 
So that's that's the kind of art, you know artistic license stuff that you have to do as well. Um, in terms of the the actual computer area, I didn't go too detailed here, and part of the reason for that is that it doesn't matter. I I knew that this was going to feature the car more, and any glimpse that we saw of the computer would sort of be from here. But then I thought, oh, you, I may as well build it out enough that I could do some nice stills. So if I turn on the wireframe on shaded, you can see just like all this stuff is just boxes with rounded corners, essentially. I've got, you know, base, very basic speakers and, and you know, these buttons are very simple. There, there's just a lot of buzziness in, in, you know, in terms of the amount of details, but the details themselves are not very crazy. Even like stuff like this, it's just, it's very simple geometry um, that I've just sort of built to subdivide. Nothing in here is UV'd yet. You can see the sort of density of my scan there. Um, I also sort of wrapped this um, emblem onto his chest, which <laughs> just so I could shade him with a, with a, the sort of chest emblem on him. Um, and, you know, stuff like the, this grate is very, you know, it's, it's, it's lightweight, but there's just a lot of it. So it, it, it just adds to the visual interest. Here's where the, the vault goes. So I got the vault in there. I still have my animation on the vault from my other file. And you can see I still got my figurine in there. But I got a problem because I have to cut a hole in this um, rock face. So the rock faces, you can see how I did them as well. Basically just a series of bend deformers and using the Maya Sculpt. Um, I really am a fan of this. Um, this, where is it? Mesh tools, sculpting. And I usually just use the grab tool, but you can see you just pull stuff around with it. So if I um, make this nice and big, you know, I can sort of affect where this is going. And basically I was just pulling stuff around till it matched in multiple camera views. Um, I have ceiling geometry as well, but I've, I've been tending to sort of turn this off because it, it, I mean, they didn't have it on set and I, I doubt that I'll be looking up there in my movie. So it just for ease of access, I just turned that that off. You can see I've got my uh, river with the, the pebbles down here. Um, and then a, wa a plane for water as well. Uh, let's go to shading, wireframe and shaded. So that's pretty much that. Um, one of the things I wanted to uh, point out, speaking of terrible reference, is this guy. Now, when I initially, this is Batman's light switch. Um, when I initially got the screen grabs for this, uh, this section, um, let's go back to that. Uh, this is what I had to work with. Let me find it. Um, it's definitely, definitely in here. This, these two. So these are very dark. It's basically two positions of the switch. And I was trying to everything. I was trying to pull these into Photoshop and pull levels on them, trying to get that, trying to just, just see what's here. But then I, you know, at some point I was watching the movie and let's go back to, to YouTube um, and look at it. And I, I just learned this about YouTube. Um, I didn't know you could do this, uh, but um, go back to the right moment. There he is. So um, I was doing this on iTunes, which you can't take screen grabs in iTunes, which is annoying. Um, but I found out yesterday, because I was like, how am I going to show them this? But I found out yesterday that you, if you use the... the um, greater than less than keys in YouTube, you can go frame by frame, but there's three frames of this where sparks fly and you can see some of the detail. So this is what I was using to sort of figure this out is these three frames of reference. And I'm pretty proud of it. This, this, I basically did this um, over this weekend, but uh, this is my interpretation of Batman's light switch. It's just, funky. Um, I'm going to sit this here and uh, let this render for, for a minute. But, um, let me see. What other stuff that I want to call out about this? Hey, Jay, while that's rendering, uh, we got a lot of questions about how long has this project taken you? 
Oh God. Um, so the first thing I built was the vault and that was in, I think January of last year. And it was just like a weekend build. It's, it wasn't, um, too crazy. I think I even had, um, it even has like weld beads that I, that, that I sort of have textured on there. Um, if I don't know if we'll get that close to it, but, um, so that was that. And then I think maybe a month later I started the car the car took maybe three months, two to three months. And then, um, then was the big Halloween costume fiasco. Uh, that was about two months of work. And then this sort of took the rest of the year and I didn't, I haven't touched this. I was it? I didn't. Oh, you know why I didn't touch this in the beginning of this year is because I went full um, Mando costume mode. So I, I, that's what I'm constantly doing is derailing myself. I was like, I'm going to the VES. I want to build a Mando helmet. So I started this whole project of, of building it. And it's actually right here. I, oh, you guys can't see me anymore. You're just seeing my screen. But um, yeah, that's kind of what consumed the the most of this year i just finished 3d printing all the rest of the armor and i i did a second version of the helmet because the first one wasn't that accurate it's it's a whole crazy thing where i'll never finish anything in my life because i'll be on to the next thing <laughs> but um yeah this this cave has kind of like i've started to work on it again um over the past couple of weeks just in preparation for this talk because I thought, you know, it's probably the most current thing that I've been working on. And you can see that this still needs work. Um, the, the lighting in here is, is a very basic setup. I've just got very, uh, other than these materials here, there's just very basic shading on the, on, you know, th this stuff st I still need to actually shade. Um, but, you know, th this is what I, I'm kind of having fun with, um, with this environment is it's, it's, using these textures and and just plugging them into these v-ray shaders has gotten me to the point where like I, I look at this and i'm like you know what that looks that looks good i'm happy with that you know so uh that's kind of a a, a cool angle that i wanted to to share with you guys i'm not just going to turn it off but and, and then i'll let the um the, the computer area is kind of fun too it doesn't have um i still need to assign shaders i had them all uh, had a lot assigned last last night but in true Maya fashion, I had a crash and lost like three hours of work. So yeah, the, the, the fun part about switching to a new version of Maya too, because um, now that I'm, now that I'm in the industry and I'm, and I, I'm not slumming it, I don't have to pirate it anymore. I can afford to pay for it. So I get, I'm on 2020 now, but of course I didn't set up auto save. Um, so I lost a bunch of work. So it happens to the best of us is what I'm trying to say. And just got to keep it, take it in stride type of thing. <laughs> I just got a quick question from the chat. Any what other do you questions enjoy? While this is going? Yeah, I, uh, totally. I got a quick question from the chat. What do you enjoy most? Design, uh, vehicles or environments? It, it depends. I kind of flip flop. Um, actually, the, the, like truly what, I really like the, the project that I really am excited about. It is sort of beyond all this fan art stuff is kind of my own IP that's been rattling around in my head for, you know, since college pretty much. And there that's, I have a, like a kind of a, a an idea for a graphic novel or, or a, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do a short film or anything, but um, you know, something like that to, to just, it's kind of a, a, a story to tell type of thing where it's, um, oh, I don't even have the the screens. I had Jack Nicholson on the screens, but I guess I, I lost that. Oh, well. Um, but that, that it's, it's kind of a story that takes place on a, like a spaceship. And like, that's kind of where, where my mind is right now. Like what, what I really think about doing something cool. And the, the Millennium Falcon is kind of that. It's a ship that's so big but you can get close to it. You can, um, it's essentially a big environment. And um, I'm going to open that up next um, just because why not? But uh, there's not much more to see in the back cave than this type of stuff. But yeah. Well, it's awesome. And I think we're all looking forward to your next stream when you show off the uh, bat plane. 
Oh yeah, I, I have that. I have that. Um, we have a hobby store um, that went out of business recently, and you better believe I bought that model. I'm gonna spray it gray and do some photogrammetry. <laughs> <laughs> so let's open up. Uh, let's open up the. Actually, I think I have a scene in here that's just spaceships. Yeah, well, so that's uh, loading. We got some more questions about like modeling techniques and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, do you use any add-ons or do you use any plugins? I have an interesting story about bonus tools. I but usually I work with very vanilla Maya. So uh, I'm all the stuff I'm using is just basic off-the-shelf stuff. Um, there's a couple scripts that I use. I don't know if you noticed my my thing is it's called SwitchCam. But this is a script that, that a buddy of mine at work gave to me. And essentially, it's mapped to a hotkey so I can quickly go between ortho and uh, 3D view. This is still loading. I should let it load. But I can quickly go between ortho and uh, 3D view with just a hotkey, which is kind of handy. Um, this, is, this isn't set up for V-Ray or anything. But um, what was interesting about this project, and, and this, is, this is also a part of that project, um, is I wanted to do a like a, a whole scene for VR. And this is before Galaxy's Edge was a thing. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to be basically you could explore the Falcon. And um, it was really kind of mind blowing the first time I brought it actually into Unreal and stood next to it. It's not as tall as you'd think. And the like, basically, if I turn on a, I have a layer here. Oh, is he in here? Okay, let me hide this. I have this Han Solo in here, um, and he's he's six foot. So if if you're around six foot, I mean you're pretty much ducking to get in here, which I, it was it was just weird to stand next to it in VR and see like oh that's not that big, and and that's kind of a, a weird uh, disconnect about working in CG that that um, it's always mind blowing to me. I remember um, I, I was fortunate enough after working on the Razor Crest for months and months to go down and see the big set piece. And it scared me because I saw how big that thing was. And I was like, there's no way I've got enough texture resolution on this thing <laughs> because it was just so massive. It was, it was, it was incredible to see. But um, on the subject of like doing this for VR, if we look at the wireframe, I did not build any of this to subdivide. So it's all very just basic blocky geometry and I was using at the time um, this is this is going to date this project but I was using mental ray rounded corners to do all this shading and I planned to bake that down to normal maps which were going to give all the edge fillets to this to this guy so the geo is all very simple um, I took kind of a games mentality of like having enough um, spans so you could see the roundness and um, eventually working on uh, the Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, which is a, essentially it's a, it's a game experience um, at Galaxy's Edge, I learned that it's better to almost have that fillet um, or, or have a chamfer or something be part of the geo, and then it saves you the draw call of the map. So when I learned that, I was like, oh, do, I could probably go back to the drawing board on this. So it's kind of what I did, um, and it's still in progress. Um, I mentioned earlier that the bottom of the ship is wrong. And if we look at it, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to see, but it's based on the Blueprints book, which is obviously the blueprint of the set. And that's kind of where I got this panel layout from. But eventually, I got this really awesome um, image of the bottom of it, which let me uncover that. There's images. I think it's in. It might be in one of these. Yeah, all these great images of the bottom. And I was like, ah. So I went back to the drawing board on it. And I, I started rebuilding it. And that's kind of where I left off is rebuilding the bottom panels. I need to still add in this, this damage. You can see that it's in um actually you can't see it because 
I have a layer called clean and a layer called damage, and there's that damage there. So I need to like remodel that in and re-sculpt it in, and that's kind of where I'm at. Um, you know, when you when you're in the weeds on something like this and you've been working on it for months and months, and a task like that comes up where you, oh, I've, I've got my perfect model. Now I have to destroy it a little bit, especially after you've already destroyed it. That's, that's when, you know, Batmobiles start sounding like fun. So that's what happens. But yeah, I also am working on the interior of this guy. Um, I eventually um, decided that instead of a texture map, I wanted all this tape to be geometry. So I wouldn't have, you know, I would never lose resolution on it. So that was another project. You can see that the buttons still need to be moved around to accommodate that. Um, but basically, uh, th this was kind of uh, funny, was um, I took this 360 image that was on, uh, that was essentially on like, uh, I, I think it's on starwars.com. If I look, let me look for it. Um, Falcon cockpit. 360. Uh, this one here. So this this is just available on the Star Wars website. You could just, oh, there's the X-Wing one. You could just sort of look around. So what I did was I just made this full screen and I kind of looked at panels and took a screen grab. And I looked at those panels and took a screen grab. And basically I took it into Photoshop, um, used the crop tool to take out the um, perspective. And then I mapped this to some geometry. So I don't think I have it in this scene, but I basically have this shape with all the locations of those buttons from those images. And that's how I was able to get this tape. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just craziness. Um, I, I don't have it in this scene either, but the, um, I have the interior, um, like roughly built. And I, my plan was that since the interior doesn't fit in the exterior, it actually pokes out to about here. Um, my plan was that you, you could walk into here in VR and at some point it would switch over to the interior and it would just hide the exterior. and You, you could sort of make it work like a Doctor Who TARDIS type of situation. But my plan was to have it and, and that kind of, you know, the promotional image from this, um, from this, uh, event is actually where the the setting of this project was going to be um well is going to be because i'm still going to do it but it's this uh bespin platform and this is basically all i had built for it um very basic uh geometry but this is um this is kind of lined up with again matte paintings from the movie uh just screen grabs from the movie and um yeah i this, this, this is the, there's the image that you all know and love at this point. <laughs> but, um, I, I had, a, I had this idea that, that you could sort of, uh, and, and I don't know if I'll ever get this level of interactivity into it just because it's, it's, uh, going to be a ton of work that I don't even know that can't even fathom how to do. But, um, I was, ha I had this idea. What if you were the mechanic on Bespin that fixes the hyperdrive? And you had to go all the way around the ship and screw this and replace this and and do that sort of stuff. And maybe you could have a little droid buddy with you. And like this, that, this was the idea behind the, that that sort of drove this whole project. Was um, I want to do this VR session essentially? And um, I thought it was cool because it's it's this very limited environment. Um, the shape language in here is very simple. There's not a lot of detail. Um, and I thought, oh, you could have cloud cars flying around and that would be cool to have that audio, that, you know, those things flying around. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of what the, um, the metal ray rounded corners looks like incidentally. Um, I miss metal ray it's dead now, but yeah, that was my jam back in the day. Um, I also made an outrider at some point, like I started doing this. What was crazy about this ship, though, is that like people can barely fit in the Falcon cockpit, really. It looks big on screen, but this whole section here is only six feet tall. So either people are crawling through here or they're just really short. I don't know, but 
that was kind of an eye-opening thing uh, for that ship. Uh, but the fun part about the uh, cloud car is I actually used my own face. Just uh, just took the scan that I had done and just down it enough where you wouldn't really see it. And then I even gave myself a mustache because I couldn't even grow a mustache in real life. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's kind of that. Oh, the Outrider is in here. Uh, let's see if I can turn it on. Yeah, so if we look, let me hide the Falcon real quick. This is just kind of nerdy Star Wars stuff. But if you Han's six feet tall, and like he's is you know, it, there's no room in here for him. It's just kind of like funny to me. I don't know. So I, I, I kind of assume that there's some kind of crawl space ladder through there or something. Maybe the, it gets a little bigger out here. I don't know. Kind of funny. It's, it's cool once you have these. Um, another part of, of building the Falcon for me was just building all these Greeble parts because I, we have a parts library at work that we, that we work from. At the time of building the Falcon, it wasn't this kind of stuff. It was like auto parts from Transformers and, you know, bits and pieces from Avengers spacecraft and um, uh, what, what is the, the big, the, uh, what is it called? The hover carrier or whatever, helicarrier. Um, so we had a lot of stuff like that, but we didn't really have um, a good parts library. And that was one of the things that uh, that one of the other goals of, of actually working on the, the Falcon was to have that. So if I go to my, where is it? Falcon, let's go to scenes. Uh, where is it? My name. Let's see, I've got a lot of stuff. Okay, so this is a project that I that I did um it's on my vimeo but um it's basically a, a like i made a crawl of of all the greebles and um i just thought it was funny because i i had set this all up um i hope that hopefully it doesn't play music but i'd set this all up um this is my blog it's called falcon a um but i set i'd set up all this parts library of stuff and then it was it was such a like a huge uh, group of parts that I was like oh this would be funny because it's like the long text and but it's like this piece here this is one of the parts that I found out I had all wrong and I have to replace um, there's a bunch of little little bits like that where I, I matched it as best I could from the reference that I had but it just isn't right at the end of the day so I gotta go in and fix it but this is um this is sort of just that it's 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 long it's drawn out go further there's lots of lots of little parts um but i actually um actually i should have opened a different one. Oh man is this really taking this long to load that's kind of weird it's not a very heavy file so while it takes a little bit to load, we got a lot of questions about your Kitbash library and if you use them and if you make them yourself. It sounds like you make them, or at least for yes. this project. Yes. So what I what I did, um, and I actually like for my own class, I have my uh, students do this as well. Is we all collaborate on a on a Kitbash library, and um, where is it? Uh, what I use is these flatbed kit scans. If you, if I look in here, I've got Falcon kit scans, and this is basically all the kits. Um, let me switch this to extra large. This is all, like all the kits, and it'll be like maybe like this piece is used or something. Um, it's not like all these parts, but you, you know, um, just off the top of my head here, I think one of these. No. Uh, one of the parts oh this part this part is everywhere um this is used a few times on the falcon um and the, like all these scans I, I found this list um both um just through rpf and i don't want to open that actually Just that but um this is where's the where's the really popular one uh this is kind of the the really recognizable oh this is the back side of it 
that's cool because like a lot of people scan the front and back of these parts so you can get a sense of like what's going on and you know oftentimes i'm not modeling the back side of things but um the only tricky part to figure out about these parts is um how tall they are so um this actually is a model kit that i own i bought it on ebay i think it was like 150 bucks because it is vintage but um that was helpful to figure this out but this is basically that piece on the front of the falcon if we look let me open a new version of this oh i think i might just have too many windows or something uh, now let's go back to let's go back to our favorite image of promotion it's that piece right there basically and um, I found some reference images where people had measured this and they had it next to a ruler. And that kind of became my Bible for the scale. And I also factored in the size of these sprues and sort of sized the other parts based on that. So that's kind of how I figured out the scale of everything. Um, now, we did a very similar thing on Rogue One. Uh, the Me and the model supervisor on Rogue One um, we really nerded out about this this type of stuff and so um i um we we actually had a, a bunch of these model kits we bought them you know when, when it's the company money it's a little different so we bought a bunch of them we 3d scanned them we um we had a we actually outsourced a lot of the building of the parts but now we've got this massive library at work of these these parts that just sort of just sort of instantly feel star wars i'm gonna kill maya uh, let's go this is uh, part of the hard surface modeling Maya experience is killing Maya once in a while. Um, let's see here. Load it up again. Let's get rid of that. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you when, when this opens up again, sort of how I, um, how I organize the parts. There's even some some files where I'm still uh, working on stuff. The other the, one of the other famous kits here is um, it's called the the C Lab, and this is a, actually a really rare kit. This is um, I do not own one of these guys, but this the, this part um, is part of the docking ring. A lot of these parts were used on the ship, and um, uh, yeah, so having these top down um it, it can be hard to sort of figure out the depth but having the additional reference was helpful but then there's stuff like well this is half a cylinder so if i scale a cylinder to this size i kind of can figure that out stuff like that you know um but yeah i, I basically went through um section by section on the ship and sort of built out all those um parts slowly but surely and that that falcon the initial build of it probably took a year and a half um of just you know maybe three four times a week putting two three four hours in um so it, it took a lot of time um and that's part of the reason why you know it took so long i don't want to go back into it but i must and now i'm, I'm i've been away from it for so long that i'm kind of like now i want it i want it go back in there you know Let's go Greeble Library. So we actually got a question about that in the chat, which said, if you were to start it from today, how would you approach it differently? Um, I would, I basically build everything to subdivide and just say, screw it. Because um, that's part of like what I'm going to do now is go in and make sure all these pieces can subdivide. Um, and that's just because... I don't want to rely on the normal maps to sort of get these um, get these going. Um, you see all the colors here. This is actually all the the, the kits that I had identified at the time. Um, and then there's these assemblies that they made of parts. And th th what's interesting about these is they basically assembled these and made castings of them. This um, this is kind of the area. Uh, let me. See. Maybe I could pull it up on my blog. I think it was up on my blog. Sorry, I keep going. I've got like two. Uh, where are you, Falcon A? No. Uh, we'll just find Falcon A. 
oh, I have a shortcut. So this is um, this plate here, and you can see that it's it's used here. It's used on the underside as well, and it's basically just a casting of that piece. And it's also on the sort of back quarter of the ship too. And then um, one of these plates, I believe it's this one, but it, yeah, I think it's this one. This is actually on the Battlestar Galactica model as well. So they definitely like assembled pieces together and and reused them. Um, but yeah, that that's kind of the main thing is I would I would just go in and make sure all these pieces could subdivide. There's also stuff like you know these. This doesn't need to be all one piece. Um, I could uh, I could sort of interpenetrate some stuff and get away with that. Um, so that that's kind of the big thing. And um, I had contemplated doing uh, face weighted normals, which is another games technique where you don't you essentially you don't have the um, I don't know if I still have the script in here. I might. Um, essentially, you do just a single instead of having the um, instead of having this sort of look, you have the basically this sort of um, this this sort of look. And uh, I think let me see if I can get this script to work. It's been a while. Basically, if I look at this now, um, let me see. Uh, th this is sort of the, the problem that I was having is um, if we look at uh, go to display and look at vertex normals. Um, basically, when you've got hardened edges, which all these pieces do have hard a mix of hard and soft, um, it counts as multiple vertices in a game engine. So uh, I was kind of like, no, that's not going to work for me because um, but when you actually have stuff smooth, See, now it only counts for one uh, vertex normal. But the problem that I was having is these aren't perfectly straight up. So you get this weird gradient effect across the, the surface. Now, when I do the face weighted normals, which is, is kind of a pain to actually uh, run this script. Um, and let me see if I actually even have it in here. Uh, I think this is it no that's not it um it's python this is it so um i'll maybe i'll pass this link along to to josh but if i run this um and we look at the the part again um basically what it's done is it based on that face selection that i did it straightened these normals out so it gets rid of that um it's rid of that banding, that, that gradient banding that you saw, but and it gives it the sort of the appearance of, um, you know, from a distance, it looks like a sort of a smoothed or a subdivided thing. Um, now, my whole thing now is just, well, why not just bite the bullet and have a little, my scene isn't that crazy heavy, so why not just bite the bullet and do the actual bevel? And let's, let's just for kicks turn on the uh, vertex normals here. So you can see this one is, you know, it's a lot more vertex normals. It's probably as much as when this was hard, but um, if I soften this, it's basically only like, uh, it's not adding that much. Let me soften this guy. But this sort of is solving that same problem where it's got these are vertical, and then these ones are just at a 45 degree angle. And from a distance, it, it does have that weird halo around it, but it's kind of the same deal. So I'm, I'm just kind of like, might as, might as well have this here in case I want to actually smooth it. So that's, that's kind of my next steps on this, is to nail down all the parts, get the right naming on everything. See, all, all these parts that are gray here are parts that I don't know where they came from, and I just built them based on reference. So um, yeah, getting the correct uh, kit and name and um rebuilding basically all these parts is my next uh phase and i'm still kind of like do i want to just subdivide them here and then essentially re-kit bash on the ship or do i want to build fix them on the ship and then rebuild this library either way it's going to be a lot of work <laughs> yeah um that's kind of where i'm out of stuff to talk about
Well, that was awesome, Jay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, we got a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, let's go for I, it. I figure we'll do a little quick Q&A if we got time. So if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the chat, and we'll try to get it to you as soon as possible. We have a couple backlogged already. Cool. Um, all right. Stuff that requires demo and screen share? or we I don't go? think so. It looks like most of it is just going to be questions about some of the projects you worked on and all that kind of stuff. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let's see. The first One of the first questions we got is, what was... What's your favorite project that you've worked on? And this is a two part because it's professional and then personal. Ooh. So I don't want to, this, this might sound a little bit jaded. Um, I think that I was really excited, um, you know, working on my first transformers, working on force awakens, but there's things about working in film production that kind of wear you down after a while. Sometimes you'll build something and you're really proud of it and you'll just get endless notes and it's like, well, what the hell? Or sometimes they'll, you'll design something that functions, like maybe it's got these hydraulics that work and stuff. And then the, you know, it gets handed to a rigger who just ignores all that and it's all crashing through. So stuff like that can get frustrating. Part of the reason that I decided to build my own Falcon was I was very frustrated with the Force Awakens Falcon. I didn't, I didn't think it looked right. And um, I hated that snow shovel uh, dish that they put on the top of it. And uh, they, were, they were doing things with the, with the, the guns that I just did not agree with. Um, let me open that guy back up. Actually, I'll open up my, um, my work in progress. You can guys can kind of see where I am. Uh, let's do date. Oh, one of the things that's cool too is um on this new one is i actually identified all the decals that are on the falcon um so i'll show that um and eventually this is this is all going to go on my blog um i'm kind of holding on to it for now but um that was that was a fun project that um, i worked on with my buddy lee um so this is kind of where i where i'm at the the Proportions of, and, and where the panels are cut is basically what's different. But now I need to sort of add that big damage in here. Um, you can see that I've got some parts here that are temp. And this is just stuff that I need to build and add. And I've also been identifying um, stuff, especially down in these pits, stuff that I missed, stuff that I have wrong um, that I need to correct. But what I wanted to show is this stuff. Um, this is all the decals and markings on the Falcon. If I turn textures on, I don't think these are all aligned, but these, this is like the famous one. Um, you know, there's stuff like this. It, it's just, it's crazy how much color and decals are on this. Uh, this is another famous one is this champion sticker. Um, there's the, there's, this is also, um, drive safely is a famous one. Um, so this, this, you know, if I look at the actual, um, texture map here, this is sort of the, um, where is it even showing it? Damn you V-Ray. I could just pull up the, the map itself. Uh, da -da -da -da, source images, decal. So um, there, li like anything else, I found basically a starting point of, um, of people who had identified all these decals. And uh, I, they had cataloged them in a spreadsheet. And I basically went through and I found ones that they didn't have. And I got lucky. This was the last decal I had to identify. And this is a trip I got. I was fortunate enough to take to the archives. I got way up under the thing with my phone and took this photo. And from that, I was able to identify, I think it's, uh, where is it? It's like one of these ones or something. Um, but let's, well, we could just look at it on here. There we go like this. It is over here. So if I grab the markings. Oh, wow. I don't have it lined up with the UVs, I guess, or something. But that's that's the last one. 
And then there's also these, these, all these little black and orange hash marks that it looks like someone just took a felt tip pen and just sort of stamped it on there. Those are everywhere. But um, yeah, they're kind of Z fighting with the surface right now, but um, eventually I'm going to use them as actual decals or something in Unreal. Um, but yeah, the, one of the things that frustrated me about the, the Force Awakens is the way these guns behave. Um, it's, it's, you know, obviously everyone remembers the, the guy sitting there. He's kind of on his back and looking out, and this gun sort of hangs from the top, right? And I have a whole blog post about my frustration with this. And that's what's kind of funny about my blog is I, I really try to, um, I, I try to uh, be tactful about what I'm saying, but um, sometimes the uh, like when I read this, I'm like, oh man, so much rage, um, a nerd rage, I guess. But uh, this is I, I made these this sort of gif of how it's how it's meant to move and function. And basically for the Force Awakens, they broke the hell out of this rig. They had it like swiveling around. At one point, they and I think this is in episode nine, they have this whole thing spinning around. And I was like, well, that doesn't make sense because there's a tube that connects them. But I mean, really nothing about this makes sense. There's no room for the ladder. And you see there's this huge ladder in the middle. Um, I thought that why does, you know, in Force Awakens, they, they or the, the sequel trilogy, they always go down to the bottom, and I don't understand why. Uh, there's no tactical advantage to it. Why does the gun hang from the, or why does the gun poke up from the bottom instead of from the top? It's just like all these things about this these uh, sequel movies that I was like, that's wrong, it's not right. And I started to rage out, and that sort of fueled the fire of, of this whole project, right? So... Uh, you know, and and I I took it into a you know account where I I was like oh well you know that does kind of explain like where the where the ladder actually is and and how how it works because no one's there's just no explaining this stuff but my whole argument was like well you don't need to explain it it's movie magic right Batman goes in one door and he comes out the other side of the Batcave it doesn't. It, it, and the the viewer doesn't go, huh? I wonder how that happened. It's just it just happens. It just works. So this this one was especially infuriating. Uh, you have this shot where you see that this this is actually backwards, and then literally it cuts away to the Tie Fighter, and then it cuts back and it's forward again. And I was like, why are you guys doing this to me? <laughs> but it's purely just nerd rage. And and if you didn't if you didn't know about it and you didn't see it or uh, if you didn't notice it, you just, you know, you probably didn't think twice about it. Well, I think it's uh, safe to say that you have done more research on this than most people. So I love that. <laughs> I think it's amazing just like how much uh, reference and how much time you've spent digging into all this. Yeah. Oh, man, this isn't set up anymore. I used to have this so it could actually rotate properly. But it looks like I've lost that angle at some point. Oh, well. Uh, we got a question coming in. Uh, what is just for beginners? Do you have any words of wisdom or advice for people that are new to 3D modeling? Uh, and then we'll have a tangent question off of that, which is when did you realize that what you really liked was modeling? Ah, this is this is kind of a, a, a good story that I definitely told before. I've done a couple talks at Noman, but um, I went to school with this guy. Obviously, you were at school the same time as me, and you were like this killer creature creature guy. I went to school with, in my term, because you were a term ahead of me, I think. Yeah, I but think so. My term, um, Dustin Blattner was in there, and he was this killer creature sculptor. And I was like, damn, I got to be better than these guys if I want to make it, right? So I really, like, you know, got into ZBrush, and I tried sculpting. And 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 I'm no slouch in ZBrush. I can I can hold my own, but I'm definitely not, you know, at, at your guys' level. And... Um, at a certain point, I think it was um, one of the classes and, and, and Alex Alvarez came in and he was like, he said something like, oh, you know, I, I, I do this stuff because it's in my head and I, I just have to get it out. It's like a, it's like an impulse. This stuff, is, I see it in my dreams. I'm doodling it in my sketchbook and in the margins of paperwork and stuff. And I kind of like had this moment where I looked at my sketchbook and it was all cars and spaceships and I was like, maybe I'm just not a creature guy. And I, that, that was when I sort of switched over to hard surface and, and like really came into my own. 
um, and um, like Max Dan's uh, class and and that stuff. But uh, one of the things I do want to sort of throw out there is this is my personal blog, which I haven't updated in since 2016, but it goes all the way back to 2008, which is before I went to Noman. And I'm kind of like, I I'm really transparent about, you know, my journey. And there's some stuff from <laughs> early days of Noman that's really like kind of crappy. And, but, you know, this is just stuff that that's part of my history. And I want it, I want it to be out there. And um, at, a, at a certain point, things just started to click. Like this was the first model that I was really finished and, and proud of. It was based on my dad's car. But like stuff like this, I look at it now and I'm like, ugh. It's like not very detailed. It, it doesn't, you know, the design is not great. Um, some of these uh, just assignments for classes that are just sort of thrown together that don't really like, like, you know, I'm not proud of it now, but. I don't know. It just, you know, all this stuff like this, um, this is kind of funny. This is like my lighting and rendering one final, but, it, and it, you could you could tell that this is what I'm interested in. But if you saw this model, it's like garbage, man. It's like, there's just nothing cool going on, <laughs> especially topology wise. A lot of it's just done with like, uh, textures and stuff. Oh, a history of Rambo. Why not? Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that was kind of the turning point was really that moment. But I mean, like, I've always been fascinated by spaceships. Um, I always loved like the cutaway uh, books from Star Wars and, um, and technical manuals. Um, I really love those Haynes manuals that are acting like if you owned the Falcon or if you owned the, the spaceships. And what's crazy is I had all these books and now I've met a lot of these artists and we're Facebook friends. And it's, it's just bizarre how, how things have, sort of turned out for me. Um, in terms of beginners, um, I would say, like, just start working on stuff, pick, pick stuff that you can, that you can achieve, like, at, like at Noman, you start by modeling a room. And I think that that having something simple like that, like, like, this is a lot. And I always, you know, when I was a student, I couldn't imagine ever doing something like this, there's so much detail. And all you all you see when you see this is time, and and really this is a year and a half of work it is a lot of time. So start like set little goals for yourself. Like maybe today I'm gonna make like I'm gonna start. I'm gonna make a gun, or I'm gonna make a something even simpler. I'm gonna make a hammer, and I'm gonna um, and, and, you know, and just start small and build your way up. And there's tons of tutorials out there. There's great classes you can take. Um, uh, I mean, no man's no man taught me everything I know about about 3D other than, you know, what I obviously learned on the job. But um, I, I came I went into that school with nothing. You know, I, I just had an illustration degree and I I'd fooled around with ZBrush a little bit. But um, yeah, I, like there's resources out there. There's YouTube. Uh, Blender is a free software that that's gaining a lot of traction. I have some buddies even in the industry who are, who are all about it and really love it. Um, and that's free. You can just go out and get that and um, just start building stuff. Just remember those rules that I talked about and you will be on your way to being a hard surface modeling artist. Um, just as an example though, like uh, let's, this, this is where this uh, keep faces together is going to come in handy because I don't want to keep them together in this case. But um, like, let's make let's make sort of a complicated shape and um, you know, even even like exercises like this where we're just figuring out what topology needs to do um, are good. Uh, let me take this guy and let's do a bevel. And you, well, I'm just going to sort of tinker with this if you want to come out with, with more questions. But, yeah, totally. Uh, um, there's a couple of the questions. Something that's been interesting in watching all your projects has has been how many projects you have and how deep you dive into your projects. And there's been a lot of questions about what other projects you have. Obviously, we talked briefly about the bat plane as, an, as a thing you're interested in. Uh, you know, it seems like more spaceships. Uh, but what other stuff, and you also talked about your own IP, uh, what kind of projects are you like, are dream projects that you would want to do for personal stuff? 
Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so I, I hop around a lot. Um, and actually, I, I do want to show the, the Mando costume at some point because there's some interesting stuff about that. Um, but I, a, a lot of times, like, I will go from a heavy CG project like the Batcave and I'll be like, you know what? I want to make a Mando armor suit now. Um, there's there's stuff that I want to do costume wise. Um, if you go to my Instagram, which is the haven for all my costume stuff, um, I made these stilts a few years ago, uh, so I could be the creature from Pan's Labyrinth, and I made them. Uh, I I did this werewolf as well. They give you these sort of dog legs. Um, so I, I I found an Instructables and I built these like uh, they're like metal and plastic and. Um, I think I have some, uh, yeah, I have some videos of me walking in them, but, um, so, uh, like, uh, it's stuff like this, it, it just kind of takes over and I don't, I don't really plan anything ahead. Um, it's kind of like now, now these are super uncomfortable. I'm thinking like, well, what can I do to make them more comfortable? So I, I have, I have that kind of on the back burner, um, ideas for, for other costumes and stuff in terms of cg it really has to strike me i've always wanted to do a big star trek ship but at the same time there's so many people that that do those really well um tobias richter chris coon um all these guys are really killer at that and i even though i feel like i could i could hang with them if i did my own i'm kind of like well, what's the point they already did it so well you know so uh, one of the one that's one of the other things that drives me is and there's my there's my Batman suit, but um, is if I haven't seen it out there done well, that's something else that that kind of drives me as well. When I started the Falcon, there was um, basically this artist Christian Froley was the only artist I'd ever seen do it, and um, I was he was a huge inspiration. I, I even I even have his. Um, have his images saved in here uh where is it it's this this guy so and 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 what's crazy is he's he's from germany and now we're friends and we talk now and it's 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 just really bizarre but that's that's another thing that i want to i want to to sort of um say is you can reach out to people and if you like i get emails and and art station messages from people starting all the time and i always answer them and you know it depends not everybody's going to do that but but you never know um like this this guy's uh you know i i love this batman site and i i basically emailed him and said hey man i'm making this batcave cg um do you know of any other shots of the batcave and he um he actually pointed me to um, a few images that, that I, I hadn't seen anywhere else. And that was really cool. And I like now, you know, we, we email back and forth once in a while. It's, it's, you know, it's just, you, you just meet people and, and um, people like, I feel like a lot of times when people collect this stuff, it's, it's like, maybe they, they have that creative itch, but they just don't have the tools. And then when you do something with their their research and their stuff, it's like, oh, they get excited. You know, someone's doing, someone's noticing what I've collected and using it. And um, this is the this is the shot that he he pointed out to me. This is actually a view of this wall, which I now um, know that I need to replace that. And look look this this edge around here has like bolts. I didn't notice that before, but that's the thing. It's like that's there but it's also not in the map painting. So it's like, well, what are you, you going to do? Um, where is the screenshots? Yeah. So those bolts are not, not there. And maybe they, maybe they just go here and stop somewhere there. I don't know, but you know, artistic license and decisions you have to make. Um, so there's this trick that, 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 um, I like to use on shapes like this. Um, and I have a script that does this, but I'll just walk through the process. Basically what I do is um, soften and harden edges by angle. And usually 30 degrees is fine. Um, in this case, okay, why is it done that? Let's set this to 60 instead. I 
feel like something is going on with with my Maya, and I don't know what it is, because this is definitely not the result. Oh, you know what? I'm I'm stupid. So it has it has softened and hardened the edges. See how these ones on this curve are soft, and these ones are hard. It's done that. It's just a display thing that it selects all the edges. But basically, the next thing that this script does is it goes to edge mode. Oh, come on. And then if you go back, it, it basically does this. It's just a mail script that my, my friend put together, but it just does this use constraints. And when you're in edge mode, you can select hard and then just do all in next. And that's basically, these are all the edges that I want to bevel. So then you can quickly just throw that bevel. Oh, this is a big bevel. Um, I forgot I built this Falcon at ILM scale, which is a unit is a foot. Um, the Batcave and stuff is a unit is a centimeter, which I, I prefer to use. I'll probably scale this guy up when I when I um, get more serious about him, I guess. All right, let's come on. Point zero two five. So this is kind of like the starting point of figuring out what does this topology need to be. I like to turn this, I play with this mitering. Um, I like radial because it does this sort of thing. Um, auto will sort of do that. It's just a personal preference. I kind of prefer that. Um, the problem is when you do radial, it does this on the curves, which is annoying. Um, if we smooth it out, it's just basically added extra edges because it can't figure out that curvature. Notice I can't select edges and that's because I've got this stupid constraints on close and reset that always so you just have to go in and clean up but i was you know when i do this process i have to go in and clean up anyway so it's not that big of a deal um but already you've got the the shape you just need to figure out what the topology needs to do so that's when i kind of go in here and like uh, let's maybe delete a lot of these edges and just sort of reroute some stuff um, but yeah, that, that this is sort of where um, where I recommend starting is just sort of making weird shapes like this. It helps to have like a reference. Maybe you do a gun. Maybe you do even something simple like a hammer. Screwdrivers, um, screws, or something that you will always have to make as a hard surface artist. And I, I can't tell you like every time I think I've made a screw for the last time, and I'm like, no, this is the screw I'm happy with. I look at it in a couple of years and I'm like, oh, this is kind of crap. So I end up remaking it. So it's just, it's one of those things. Um, but yeah, then, you know, just coming in here. Um, now I'm kind of, um, I'm a little bit anal about, if you couldn't tell, I'm a little bit anal about um, supporting edges. I want all these supporting edges to, um, you just do that and have all quads, yeah. All quads is a victory, except I have these supporting edges on these corners, but I actually need some support here. When I smooth this out, see how this curve starts way over here? I want to start it somewhere like there. So I'm just going to throw in edge, edges here and here, and that will sort of straighten that out. So that's that's um, that's one thing I always harp on my, my own students about. It's like, eh, I got to fix that stuff. But yeah, and then, you know, it's figuring out Oh, what do I do with this? These these types of corners are actually pretty easy because you just have to connect them kind of like that. And then this just goes to this corner and you're good. Boom. So it's, you know, figuring this stuff out. And this gets more complicated when you're doing something like a Corvette where it's like, a, um, you know, like this guy, uh, this Corvette here. It, it you know these sort of curvy shapes are, are where where the real challenges are um adding these sort of cuts into these shape that's that's a relatively flat shape but um these sort of bubbles and getting them to look good and a lot of times people people get too thrifty with resolution and um you just for stuff like this you just need more of it you just need more spans and um that stuff sort of comes together like here, um, you know, you could you could have done this this curve with just three edges if you wanted, but 
I, you know, I treated myself to, to four, so, or five. So it's, it's just, you know, I think there's a, there's a time and place to be sort of thrifty and a time and place where you just treat yourself to, to the extra topology to make your life easier. Um, I do want to, because I, I mentioned the, the bonus tools thing. I'm going to open my Mando costume. Oh, yeah. There was also somebody was asking about the script you had before. Uh, which one was that? The switch, switch cam? Maybe? Yeah, switch cam. They were wondering if that was something you could share. Or not. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't mind sharing it. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's out there in the, the world. Like if it's online anywhere, I might just have to like send it to you and you can share it out. But um, sure. yeah, I'm happy to do that. It's, it's a great script. And the, the, the thing is like, you just have to, um, you just have to map it to a hotkey. That's the only tricky part about it, really. Need to save that. Come on, Mando. So actually, like I started um, working on this Mando helmet, um, and I ended up buying a lot of these uh, additional armor parts from some guy on Etsy who had made them. Because at a certain point, I was like, "Do I really want to spend all the time modeling this stuff, or can is this stuff good enough?" Um, let me turn on the. Arnold render Hold this over here so up until like this last week I've been using Arnold um, it's just so peppery so um, this is the version two of my let me actually hold still so it can render actually you know what we're not gonna do that we're, we're just gonna hit seven and turn the light on there we go so this is the second version of my helmet um, and the whole the whole thing is like, I made this helmet because I wanted to wear it at VES. I took it to VES, and then like my essentially my boss down there was like, ah, you know, John Favreau might not be happy with you if you did that. And I was like, crap. So um, I ended up not uh, not using it. Where is this helmet? Two and Mark One. Why is this? Is this just hidden? Or is it just in the same spot? I don't understand what's going on here. Oh, I unhid this whole folder. That's what it is. So um, this was my first, let me turn the grid off. It's my first go at it. And and I used the um, Inovos images. Um, they released a bunch of images of their helmet that they were producing, um, which yeah, I don't need to pull them up. But you can see how the, the, the sides sort of taper in, whereas like now I've got them tapering out. Uh, the overall size is a little bit bigger. And these earpieces, um, and this is funny because I can tell Inovos used the same scan data that I got when I was doing the digital double of Mando uh, because... It's got this like this perfectly rounded shape, and um, that's essentially what the scan looked like. But it's actually more of like a weird, sort of warped horseshoe shape. Like it's it's got these like corners here, which was kind of weird. And then this was a very like I don't really like having those sort of weird stretched um, polygon surfaces. Like mine were perfectly flat, right? But they they're just wrong. And so I I, I took another stab at it after I um made my first one. And this is all um, on the, the Instagram. If we go back up. Oh, God. These are the, these are the two versions, essentially. So um, and this is this is after like, I do all the Bondo and sand work and stuff. And this is sort of just the raw print. Um, you can see there's a lot of vibration <laughs> on the print, but um, it all sands out. And this this actually I have um, Currently, it's ready to mold. Um, I just need to pour some silicone into it. But um, that was kind of what I wanted to show in regards to bonus tools. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all the armor I've got. Where's my... Uh... Well, it's very cool. It's awesome that you switch between characters and environments and vehicles, and you're kind of bouncing around between all different types of stuff. Well, I mean, it's it's like it's character, but it's still it's still hard surface. Let's be sure. real. Like it's <laughs> you know, um, this is a 
I think I, what I ended up modeling for myself was the, these hand plates, the back and butt plates. Um, these I had modeled for myself, but his I thought were a little more accurate. And then uh, this chest plate is I modeled, but the rest were um, this guy, Darren Pattenden is his name. Um, but let me sort of get rid of that. I'm going to isolate this guy. So this is my, um, actually, not that one, this one. What's going on here? So um, I have this helmet ready. To, this is basically, I made myself a buck that I, I could 3D print and it, like it doesn't have any holes in it. So I know that I can pour rubber around it. Um, and I had tried to make this fiberglass mold jacket because I wanted to make my first matrix mold. Um, but the fiberglass was really a pain to work with. I didn't like it. So I decided I'm going to make a mold jacket that essentially is 3D printed as well. So I, um, I just sort of built it out from the shape. You can see the cavity uh, in between the helmet and the this thing. And essentially, all you do is you mix up silicone and you pour it in there, and it sort of makes a mold in the inside, almost like an injection um, type thing, except you're not forcing it in. But the problem with that is I didn't know how much silicone I needed. So what I did was I actually figured out the volume in between the helmet and that mold jacket. I modeled that piece essentially and bonus tools has uh, in the display window, it has a volume, poly volume. And this, um, this is um, millimeters cubed, uh, which I was able to calculate into knowing that I had about two liters, but that's really, the, <laughs> it's really the only thing I've used bonus tools for sadly. Although it's, it's, it is good for, um, if you want to do, uh, uh, sort of a weird selection like that. And you do, it's probably hard to see because this material. But say I wanted to, um, come on. Say I wanted to grab every other edge. There's a great script in bonus tools that does that, which is just select every nth, which, yeah. Well, I don't know why to do it, but. I swear something's up with Maya and I, 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 I want to blame V Ray. I don't know if it's V Ray's fault, but yeah, there you go. Let's do that again. Cause I selected everyone. Why isn't it doing it? It's bizarre. Well, normally that works. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that's one of those things. Whenever you're, you're demoing or teaching, there's always something like that. Sounds good. All right, Jay, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, you have so many projects you've been working on, like yeah. a ton. <laughs> it's awesome to see how much work you've been putting in. And like, I like how you started with like, here's the Batman suit. Well, here's the vault. And then I decided yeah. to put a, a suit in the vault. And then I got to put, you know, I got to do a... Uh, <laughs> Then I'll do the Batmobile and then I'll do just like the diamond plate. And then I'll do the whole, like, it just kind of this, this continual building of like over and over and over. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like you're digging a hole, I'm probably digging my own grave, but um, yeah, it, it always happens that way. Like and it, and all it takes is like the right piece of reference to just inspire me to like dig deeper mm -hmm. and it, it just happens, you know? Um, but I, it's, it's, it's crazy because I, I, like, I'm always hungry to learn the next thing. Um, you know, this, the, the bat cave was, uh, the Batmobile was really my, I want to learn substance mm -hmm. excuse. Um, the bat cave is, I want to learn, like, you know, I want to learn, uh, at first it was more about Arnold and now it's, I want to learn V-Ray. So I'm, I'm sort of figuring that out, but it, it's all sort of like towards a goal, you know, and, and. And it's, it's, it's really just an itch that I need to scratch, which, you know, you would think that work would scratch that itch, but it really just doesn't. So I don't know if it's a control thing or what, but 
not complaining. That's awesome. <laughs> well, it looks like we've got an, most of our questions answered from the chat. So nice. uh, I think we're going to wrap up our stream here. Uh, thank you again to Jay for being our first uh, digital event. Uh, that was awesome. Much, much appreciated. Uh, and of course, as always, thank you to Lenovo for being our event sponsor. Um, check out more of events. We're going to be having them uh, throughout this month and the rest of the month. We're also doing uh, weekly streaming on Twitch on Wednesday mornings. And we have a bunch of other digital things that should be coming out soon. So please stay tuned and check into that. Uh, otherwise, that's it. Thank you guys very much. And we'll see you soon. Bye, guys. <laughs>